like, we have a therapist, obviously, for Cooper, and he's like, well, we need to work on separating the plot and the because they're like, they're like sitting right there to fight you. And they need to, they're protective of each other. Oh, yeah. Okay, like, Harrison and Cooper are like best friends, they're our neighbors, and he's always over there, and like, they're, they fight like brothers.
Mark Oppenheimer, is the author of five books, including Knocking on Heaven's Door, American Religion in the Age of Counterculture, and the newish Jewish Encyclopedia. He was the religion columnist for the New York Times from 2010 to 2016, has written for the New York Times Magazine, GQ, Mother Jones, The Nation, and The Believer, among other publications. Um, the host of Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox. If you haven't listened to it, it's so good. I started. Oppenheimer has taught at Stanford, Wellesley, and Yale, where, where since 2006 he has directed the Yale Journalism Initiative. He lives with his family in New Haven, Connecticut. Mark, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. What a fabulous turnout. This is great. Um, thank you for bringing me out here. I think this is my, um, something like my 40th talk since the book published in October. Uh, I'm talking about live talk. I mean, I've done more on Zoom, but it's amazing how people have found a way to come out and, and see me and, um, and hear. And, and it's, it's in, it, a, a high percentage of them seem to be Pittsburghers because I've discovered that when you write a book about Spurrell Hill, you, you develop a superpower, which is wherever you go, Pittsburghers come out and see you. It's like, it's crazy. I actually gave a talk uh, not far from where I grew up. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts. And uh, there's a very good bookstore just up the road in South Hadley where Mount Holyoke College is called the Odyssey Bookstore. And so in some ways, this was my hometown. It's 20 miles from where I grew up. And it's the, it, this was the event that my parents came to, including my dad, who grew up in Squirrel Hill. And there were, you know, it was like a nice turnout, but it was a cold night in November, December. Maybe there were 20 people. It turned out something like five of them were Pittsburghers. And, and they knew each other, but didn't actually know that, that they, they did, each didn't know the other was from Pittsburgh. Like they'd known each other as South Hadley or Northampton or Western Mass people, but only during the Q&A did they discover they had grown up two blocks in this direction, four blocks in it. And so I, I like made a Pittsburgh shit up. Like they all of a sudden had this, <laughs> this new thing in common. Um, and I love that. I, I absolutely love, there's been no place I've talked where there hasn't been a Pittsburgher who has shown up in, in about 40 cities in 30 states. So, um, so thank you for coming out. And I think the book, I, I think that my talk, and God willing if you read the book, does explain some of how Pittsburghers um, uh, are nurtured by a very specific kind of community that really does promote very, very deep ties. And I know, by the way, that I'm in another town that has fourth and fifth generation Jews as well. And so it's not something that will be completely foreign here. So I want to thank all the people who have made it possible to bring me out here. And um, I'm excited to sign your books afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I feel it's, it's, it's a bit poignant. I've been talking about this book since October. Um, in the past month, I've had COVID and gone to the dentist. So I feel like I'm my best self. You know, I'm like, <laughs> my teeth are clean. I know that I'm COVID free. It's like, this is in some ways the, a great space in which to do a valedictory talk. I'm not, I'm not talking about this book again until October. Um, I have a couple of things lined up already. So, um, and again, it's Pittsburghers who make it happen. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'm gonna talk to you for maybe 25 minutes and then I would really like to take your questions and, and have a conversation and here, you know, what can I tell you? What can I explain about the reporting, about the city, about hate, um, about mass killings? We are in the era of mass killings in America. Um, Columbine was in 1999. So when I talk to college students, I say, if you're 22 or 23, if you're a 22 year old senior, your life has been exactly contemporaneous with the era of mass killings in America. You have grown up with that in a way that somebody born in 1974 just didn't. I mean, I was out of college by the time it started. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to read you a passage from the book. Well, first I'm going to give just a, a, tell you where I was on the day of the killings, October 27, 2018. Then I'm going to read you a short passage. Then I'm going to show you about 12 photos from the book and explain the backstory of those photos, give you a kind of peek inside. Again, that'll take less than half an hour, and then I want to take your questions. So part one of three. October 27, 2018. I was not at my home shul in New Haven, Connecticut. I was up at Temple Emmanuel in Newton, Massachusetts with my eldest daughter, Rebecca, who was uh, on the bat mitzvah circuit that year. We don't have a large circuit in New Haven, but she goes to Camp Ramah in uh, New England, uh, the one in Palmer, Massachusetts. So she had the, the Benot mitzvah of friends of hers um, in the whole region from Boston down to Washington, DC. And um, I told her we can't go to all of them, but I'll drive you to a few key ones. 
And this was the, the bat mitzvah of a good friend of hers. So we had gotten up very early, driven from New Haven to Newton about two hours on an early morning with no traffic. And we had been in shul all morning and we don't, we don't bring our phones into synagogue and so I wasn't getting texts or anything. And you know, Temple Emmanuel is enormous. I mean, there, there are two or three B'nai Mitzvah every weekend, year round, huge place. There were two that morning. So there, you know, there were 200 kids there for my, my daughter's friend. There were 200 people there for the other kid who had a Bar Mitzvah that day. I mean, it was, it was mobbed. Surely a bunch of those people had their phones and were checking messages, like, right? Surely some people knew what was going on. And yet I find it very moving in retrospect that somehow people weren't talking about it at the tables in the social hall at lunch, that there was a kind of sense, if people knew, that they were not going to let it infect the room where these two kids were, were becoming a B'nai Mitzvah. And that's very moving. So, Rebecca and I didn't know anything until we got back out to my car at about one o'clock. I took out my phone to text my wife. And I saw all these text messages saying, did you hear about Pittsburgh? Aren't you from Pittsburgh? Are you going to Pittsburgh? What's up with Pittsburgh? I had no idea what was going on. So I navigated over to my news app and I saw that there had been a, a shooting and I kind of read what they knew at that point about it, which was very little. And my daughter sitting in the passenger seat in the parking lot, looked at me and said, Dad, what, what's wrong? She, I must have just looked stricken. And I said, there's been a shooting. Um, Jews have been killed in Squirrel Hill. And she said, Dad, isn't that where we're from? And I was amazed that she knew that because of course she's from New Haven, Connecticut. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. Like, how did she know that the family, but I guess she had either heard me talking about it or maybe my dad, her grandpa, talking about growing up in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. And, and she knew that that was a part of family lore. And um, she had a sense that this mattered. And I, so I said, yeah, you're right. I said, that's where grandpa's from. And four generations of his family before that are also from Pittsburgh. And she said, you know, did we know anyone who's killed? And I said, honestly, I don't know because I do have cousins who are still there and I didn't know which was their shul. So I had no idea what was going on. As it happens, my cousin Steffi is one of the past presidents, recent past presidents, of Beth Shalom, which is the other conservative synagogue <laughs> in Squirrel Hill. Um, and she was out of town that weekend anyway. But, you know, it was terrifying. Anyway, over the next few days, I, um, of course, being that I'm a journalist who covers religion, and especially given that I do have Pittsburgh connections, a lot of people were saying, are you going to go cover this? And for the first week or so, I had no interest in covering this. You know, I have written about a lot of horrific things um, in my 25 years as a reporter. I've also written a lot about a lot of terrific things. One of the wonderful things about covering religion is actually a lot of it's really happy and meaningful and it's about people who are seeking connection and meaning and, and truth and they're asking eternal questions. I love walking into religious spaces and hearing people's stories about why they're there, whether they're deeply observant or highly secular. It's just, it's a, it's a extremely uplifting beat in some ways, but sometimes it's not and I have had my share of covering um, you know, sexual exploitation, abuse, financial corruption, and so forth. But I'd never covered murder. Uh, I'm not someone who's done war reporting, nor am I particularly interested in it. Um, I hadn't covered um, a lot of you know, violent crime. But over the next week or two, as I thought about Squirrel Hill, I realized there was something I had to contribute, which was not a book about, or an article, or whatever it was going to be, about the murderer, um, because I had no particular interest in, in spending my time in the racist bowels of the right-wing internet. That just like, the person, and I should say alleged murderer, he has not been convicted, but the person they are pretty sure did it, um, spent a lot of time on Reddit and Gab and horrible websites that I don't even know about, spewing and imbibing ra racist hatred and anti-Semitic hatred. I just didn't want to write a book about that journey of his. Though I think that such a book would be important, um, and I do think we have to understand him. Nor did I want to write a book about the victims, which was the next thing people would say, is do you want to write about the 11 dead? And I, I think they were probably all very beautiful souls, but it didn't strike me as a book for me to write. There's probably somebody who, who, who knew them or is more embedded in Pittsburgh who could bring that to light. And of course, pieces have been written about them. But I realized that what I wanted to write about was actually the neighborhood, because given that we are a country that's had several hundred mass killings since 1999, 
one of which is very close to me. I know a mother whose son survived the Newtown massacre. That's about 20 miles from New Haven. Um, it occurs to me that what we hadn't seen a lot of was writing about how communities respond. What happens to a place when that happens? What happens to a Parkland or a Charleston or a Milwaukee or an Orlando or a Las Vegas or a Eureka, Illinois? I mean, there are hundreds of them, right? When, when, ten, when five or, or nine or 11 of its members are just disappeared or wiped out or murdered uh, from disparate families, disparate age groups. And it occurred to me that most of these killings happen to random assemblages of people. In other words, if a mass killing happens at a mall or a movie theater or a post office, the people who are targeted had nothing in common except they all went shopping or they all went to the movies that day. They don't know each other, right? They, they, in fact, if it's at a mall or a cineplex, they may be from like a hundred square mile radius, right? So the aftermath is kind of disjointed and scary and isolating. The families don't know each other. If there's financial compensation, they may be at odds over who gets it. They have different mourning practices. These, want, these are Catholic, these are Protestant, these are Jews. There's not much, it's hard to form community around it. But in Squirrel Hill, the people murdered were people who knew each other and came together and lived near each other and dovened together and, and, had, and were almost all from families that had been there for close to a century. So it occurred to me that you might be able to examine how community responded in the aftermath of something like this. So I began traveling to Squirrel Hill. Uh, I went for the first time several weeks after the killing in November of 2018. I went 32 times over the next year and a half, um, interviewed about 250 people, everything from people who were inside the building or who did lose loved ones to you know, the caterers who had to cater the shivas, the florists, police officers who responded, doctors, nurses, neighbors, people, a lot of people who were exercising that morning. <laughs> That's a kind of common story. It's like, thank God I was at aerobics that morning. It's like, you know, the amount of Jews who wake up and say, it's Saturday, I could Zumba or I could go to shul. <laughs> like, that's the option. And, you know, that was a good morning to pick Zumba at the JCC. So um, that was a story I heard not, not a few times. Um, but those were interesting people. And the question of how they all connected and how did they help each other heal and how did people who were in the concentric circles around the killing, who were a degree or two or three removed, and everyone in Squirrel Hill is, is no more than a two or three degrees removed, um, how did they all respond? That was the question I wanted to ask. How does neighborhood, how does deep, rich, you know, high solidarity neighborhood, multi-generational neighborhood respond to something like this? And given that Squirrel Hill is actually, I think, the oldest stable Jewish neighborhood in the country. Um, it has been about a third Jewish for 100 years, which is longer than any of the New York or Chicago or LA suburbs. Um, it's, it's, it's to be as substantially Jewish as consistently for as long is unique in America. So it was a kind of interesting experiment to look at how a community like that would handle, uh, the. how could the best sort of community handle the worst sort of thing was the question. Okay, so. I now want to read to you part two of three. I want to read to you just uh, uh, two pages from the book. Um, I actually find readings very boring, and I can't s stay focused during them. So, um, so the good news for you is that I'm sparing you a long reading, um, and going to read you a very short reading. Hold on, but now I have to find it. Um, okay, here we are. So this is um, the last two pages of the prologue, or near the end of the prologue. Um, and it's, it's a few paragraphs about a woman named Tammy Haps, who's about 40 years old. She actually grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, outside Philadelphia. Um, but her ancestors were from Pittsburgh and having made um, a nice career, she went to Harvard, moved to New York, worked for NBC for many years, helped develop their digital web strategy. And then in her late 30s began, became interested in genealogy and ended up going to Pittsburgh a lot to research her family history and became, ended up living there, moving there, became very involved in the conservative Jewish community there, or I should say the Jewish community writ large, and um, kind of knew everybody, um, was active on many volunteer committees, historical society, Hever Kadisha, you know, s s she's a kind of a lay cantor. She has a pretty voice. She sings a lot. Just everything. She, everyone knows Tammy Hepps. So in the day after the killing, she was like everywhere. She was consoling people at the JCC where people gathered. Um, she consoled, in fact, the widow of one of the victims. She um, helped draft a letter to President Trump asking that he not come. Um, she, 
she said she said psalms outside the synagogue. You know, the, she said to kill him outside the synagogue because the bodies she wanted to keep the bodies company in that tradition. Finally, after like a day and a half of this, she's she's heading home. She's walking home to sleep. Um, she lives on Ellsboro Avenue where my dad grew up, and she's on her way back to Ellsboro. And she passes by Tree of Life, and um, I'm just going to tell you what happened. Um, when she made a turn onto Murray Avenue, a truck pulled up in front of her. Murray, after which Wendy's dog is named. Um, on the side of the truck were painted three curious words, crosses for losses. As Hepps remembered it, she looked into Greg Zanus's truck and saw a pile of Christian white crosses in the back. On quick count, she decided there were 11 of them, like the 11 dead. As soon as she grasped what she was seeing, she was incensed. I thought to myself, you have got to be fucking kidding me, Hepps remembered. And I looked around and no one else was there. And I thought, if I have to be the one to tell him he can't put crosses on the synagogue, I will be the one to tell him he can't put crosses on the synagogue. Hepps had no idea who this guy was with this kind of nerve. As she was figuring out what to say to him, trying to keep her cool, she saw on the front seat of this truck a pile of wooden six-pointed stars. She was relieved. I thought, OK, what will happen here is he's going to put the stars of David on the crosses, and it will be OK. Greg Zanus got out on the driver's side of the truck and approached Hepps. She looked him up and down. He was tired, unshaven, old. What was he doing here? Where had he come from? Then she looked down and saw his hands, and it became clear. I saw his hands were covered in white paint, Hepps remembered. It's like he painted these things overnight and didn't even have time to wash. He told me his intention. He said to me, I made these things, got in my truck, and drove nine hours. There was white paint on his hands. He said to me, I've been driving the whole time. I don't even know the names of the people who died. I have to write their names on the, on the stars. And then Tammy Hepps knew what she had to do. Her mother had emailed her the full list of the dead that morning. So she had the names on her phone. Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Malinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, Irv Younger. I brought up this list, and he said to me, can you please write the names in my notebook? When Hepps had written down all 11 names, she gave the notebook back to Greg Zanus. Now she had a question for him. I said to him, why do you do this? He said there had been gun violence in his family, and that this was his response to it. He said, you remember Parkland? I did that one. Remember Columbine? I did that one too. It had never occurred to me Tammy Hepp said, that it was one person who had made it his life's work to drive around the country and do this. And at that moment, I realized that we were just another one on the list. So um, this is Tammy Hepp's having an absolutely serendipitous, coincidental encounter with Greg Zanus, who was actually became very famous. Um, some of you may have seen the 60 Minutes did a piece on him when he died uh, two years ago. Um, his obituary was in the New York Times. He had founded this organization called Crosses for Losses that put crosses at the site of people who died of died violent deaths in mass killings, um, hurricanes, fires, police shootings, and so forth. He had spent the last 25 years of his life, since the mid-90s, uh, putting several million miles on a series of different pickup trucks, driving around, putting these crosses in lawns, um, or, you know, or near near the deaths. But, but he had always done it in this incredibly ecumenical interfaith way, which is if they were Jews, he would affix a Star of David to the front of the cross. If they were Muslim, he would put a crescent moon. He had different, he knew a, a symbol to use for Sikhs and Hindus and Baha'i and so forth and so on. So he, he was just this kind of Pied Piper of, of interfaith understanding and she bumps into him and, and, and it, that was a kind of an amazing thing that happens in the aftermath of a killing is these people show up and, and bring love however they can. So let's turn to my photos now, part three. Um, this is the cover of the book and it didn't occur to me until the book was already out and in bookstores how symbolically interesting it was. because I didn't design it, of course, the, the graphic designer did, I love it, but um, it's the scene at Tree of Life, maybe you know, a day or two, 48 hours after the killing, and it's already become a kind of memorial garden outside. Now, what are the two elements of the garden? You see candles and you see flowers. Now, candles, of course, are the, the, the ultimate Jewish ritual symbol, right? We use candles to bring in the holidays, to leave the holidays. We use them on the yard site and of loved ones to remember people who've died. Like, you can't do Judaism, you can't do a wedding, you can't do Judaism without candles. 
Christians actually don't use them for as much. They're decorative. You know, they'll, they'll light candles at the Catholic Mass, but you don't need them. Conversely, Christians use flowers for everything, and Jews don't. We don't, I mean, we can put flowers at grave sites, but what we put there are, are stones on graves and dirt. And, um, you know, we use flowers because we're Americans and we like flowers. But ritually speaking, this was the marriage of the Jewish candle and the Christian flower. And already within 48 hours after the, the murders, you could see how this was symbolically becoming an interfaith response to it. This is Greg Zanus, of whom we just spoke, with one of his crosses. And this is not at Squirrel Hill. This, there are hundreds of photographs of him um, at, at hundreds of cities, and so this is somewhere else. But you can see what his crosses look like. One of the things that comes to a neighborhood after um, a mass killing is a lot of visual culture. Designers end up shaping how we respond to it. So who here has seen this symbol? Can you raise your hand if you've seen it? So almost, almost all of you. Um, I wanted to find out who created this. I was not the first to find him, I should say. But um, it turns out a guy named Tim Hines, not Hines like the ketchup, which is a big Pittsburgh company, but it's spelled differently, um, who is a, a Gentile graphic designer from the south suburbs. He's from a lapsed Lutheran German-American background. And he was driving home that morning, um, listening maybe on the radio to what had happened, and he was so torn apart, so, so moved, so sad. He got home and he decided he wanted to create something to, uh, to show that Pittsburgh loved its Jews. So he thought, well, what, what represents Pittsburgh? And he thought the Pittsburgh Steelers, so he took the Steelers logo. And he thought, what represent, represents Jews? And he thought, that star they have, the Star of David. So he, he removed the yellow hypocycloid, it's called a hypocycloid, I learned, uh, that geometric shape, um, from the Steelers logo and replaced it with a yellow Star of David. Then he removed the word Steelers and replaced it with Stronger Than Hate. And he put it on the internet, he put it on Facebook, just, just to throw it up there. It, didn't, it was just his gesture into the universe. And within a few hours, it had circled the world trillions of times, and the next day, people were holding it up at the Steelers game. And on Monday, the shopkeepers in Squirrel Hill all had it in their windows. And before you knew it, it was on yarmulkes and babies' bibs and onesies and everywhere and everywhere. And it was created by this Lutheran German guy in you know, the south suburbs who didn't know anyone in the... In, who didn't know anyone who was killed. He was like three or four degrees removed, and yet he created the iconic symbol of it. Um, many of you will have seen or remember that the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette ran this headline the Friday after the killing, so this would have been the last day of um, the funerals. Imagine a community that has to bury 11 people in four days, Tuesday through Friday, 11 dead, 11 shivas. Um, of course, two of them were brothers, two of them were a married couple, but um, it was basically just just you know, endless grieving for a week. And on the last day of the, the, sh the funerals, the Post-Gazette published this um, headline, which some of you will know is the first line of the Mourner's Kaddish, Yitkadav, Yitkadash, Shemir Rabah. And this was the idea of the editor of the Post-Gazette, David Shribman, uh, who was a Jewish man, belongs to a different temple in town, married to a Roman Catholic woman. Their daughter, Natalie, is a newly ordained reform rabbi um, up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And... Um, and he just had this idea that like, what would really speak to the tragedy is to publish something in Hebrew. And if some people couldn't read it, they'd still kind of get it, you know? So he called his rabbi, Jamie Gibson, and said, could you send me the first line of the Kaddish? So Gibson did. But then when Shribman took it to his design team that prints the types, does the typesetting, the digital typesetting, they said, we don't have a Hebrew font that big. So they had to create something that night. And then when it went out Friday morning, it like changed the world. Everyone who got the newspaper on their doorstep or at the, the newsstand or at the kiosk just saw it and people broke down crying. And it was kind of an instant, instant classic. Um, staying with the visual culture, this is the Starbucks at the corner of um, Forbes and Shady. Um, it's the, probably the more populated of the two Starbucks in Squirrel Hill. And um, this is an extraordinary piece of public art. The lapsed Presbyterian American manager of the Starbucks, Melissa Lysot, uh, wanted to do something for her Jewish customers. It's a, it's, it's a Starbucks where there's lots of Jews, <laughs> including a lot of observant Jews, Orthodox Jews, get their coffee. And she wanted to do something for them. So she asked her friend, um, uh, Nicole Flannery, Roman Catholic, who's an artist, would you do something in the windows? 
and Nicole went and found a Jewish man who could help her with Jewish, with Hebrew lettering and Jewish symbolism, and they agreed to put up a Star of David, a Tree of Life, and a dove, um, with the words Ahava, Chesed, and Tikva, love, kindness, and hope, and she painted it on Sunday through Tuesday, and Tuesday people were just like walking by, and there was crowds of people gathering outside the Starbucks. Like, what is this? And it's still there. It's become a permanent piece of the the landscape. And I love the idea that 30 years from now, there will be teenagers having their frappuccinos inside the Starbucks, sitting at the big table, and they'll see the reverse image in the window, and they'll say, what is that? And somebody will explain to them that commemorates something, a terrible thing that happened here. Um, last bit of, of public art, um, this little, you can see that little Star of David. Um, there was a project to collect thousands of handmade Stars of David from around the world. Uh, a lot of them were made by children in classrooms, made of popsicle sticks, glitter paper, paper mache, yarn that was knit, etc. And a team of people in Pittsburgh gathered them all together and in December fanned out across the city and hung them from trees and street signs and statuary. And, and then they kind of naturally dissolved over the winter. This was the last one I saw. This one was still hanging from the Squirrel Hill welcome sign on Forward Avenue right off the, the interstate in March. Um, and then the next week when I was driving in, it was in the mud. It had finally fallen, so I saved it. Um, I like this photo. I don't know whose funeral this is, whose hearse this is, but the fact that you see these Orthodox Jews walking behind the hearse is significant. Remember that none of the dead was, uh, was Orthodox. There were three congregations housed in the building, um, two historically conservative congregations, one reconstructionist, but it was a total, in, totally intra-faith, not just intra-faith, but intra-faith effort to do the mourning because the Orthodox community stepped up to help provide shomrim, people to guard the bodies, to stay with the bodies until they were interred because you don't ever want to leave a body alone until it's buried. Um, they helped with the cleanup, with the, uh, you have to bury all organic matter if there's blood matter or brain matter or bone on the walls after a shooting. It's supposed to be collected and given a proper burial, so they helped with that. Um, they helped with the taharas, with the cleanings of the bodies, preparing them for... So there was, there was a lot of cooperation with different denominations and branches within Judaism, and I think that's just kind of symbolized by these men walking with the hearse to the, the cemetery. That is something that's so unusual in American Judaism that different streams of Judaism live amongst each other and know each other and help each other, and that was one of the very moving things about Squirrel Hill. And then, of course, there were non-Jews who helped out. Um, this guy, Shai Khatiri, woke up uh, that morning in Washington, D.C. He's an Iranian expatriate, lives in America, is studying for citizenship, uh, loves America, loves Jews. And uh, he, um, he saw what had happened. He was, he was just destroyed. He went to his local coffee shop and started a GoFundMe page to raise money for, uh, for Tree of Life and, and the families. And within a few days, it had raised something like one and a half million dollars. It had kind of went viral that he was doing this. So he, I think it's fair to say, is the single most successful individual fundraiser in the aftermath of the Tree of Life killing. And he's this like Muslim American, ex-Muslim, ex-Iranian, you know, expatriate American grad student at Johns Hopkins who just like wanted to do this. And when I asked him for a picture of himself, I think it's not meaningless that he sent me a picture of himself holding Plato's Republic and standing in front of the White House, just to kind of say, like, Western civilization, I love you. Um, at that Starbucks, a group of teenagers planned, uh, started, starting around noon, while the, while the crime scene was still active, started planning a Havdalah, an event to end Shabbat, a big, a big vigil. They wanted to have something public that night. Interestingly, the grown-ups, the, the Federation people, said we're going to do something Sunday. We, it's, we're not going to try for something Saturday night, but the teenagers said we have to do something now and an interfaith group of about a dozen, mostly uh, female um, senior girls from Alderdice High School made this all happen. You can see on the left, um, that is Emily Pressman, a Jewish uh, girl, now a college student, a junior or senior, holding a Havdalah candle. And to the right, uh, to her left, but our right of her is Isabella Smith, Isabel Smith, who is biracial, half African-American, ancestrally Christian, and they were two of the dozen people who helped plan this. And this is what they pulled off. Um, that's the corner of Forbes and Murray. Thousands of people were there that night singing um, and praying um, and bringing, in, bringing out Shabbat together while remembering the victims. It is significant, by the way, that this photograph is taken from the steps of Sixth Presbyterian Church. You can't see it. It's behind you in this photograph, which, of course, was the church of Mr. Rogers. 
And I, I, it is an interesting fact, a meaningful one, I think, that when Fred Rogers decided that he was going to um, you know, create a fantasy world in which children were safe and could play together and could live out their dreams, he looked out of his window in Squirrel Hill, and that was his model. So Mr. Rogers' neighborhood actually is Squirrel Hill. Of course, when I'm talking to people under 17, I have to say it's Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. But, um, <laughs> but for those of us of a certain age, we know that it's Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, the president did come. He came on Tuesday after the killing, and that was somewhat controversial. There were people who thought that Rabbi Myers of Tree of Life should not greet him. There, uh, other people said, of course, you have to greet him. Um, and he ended up saying, you know, I give hospitality to anyone who comes. So he met with the president and the first lady. You can see, um, you can see some of Greg Zanish's stars some of his crosses for losses with stars, um, and some of the names, Sylvan Simon, Bernice Simon, they were married um, in the room in which they were killed together. They'd been married 60 years earlier. Uh, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, and so forth. Uh, the anti-Trump protest that happened that morning, um, somebody said to me, I think the largest gathering of Jews in Pittsburgh history was the anti-Trump protest. <laughs> Which, you know, there's no way to prove that. Lots of people at the protest weren't Jewish. But it is true that it was a larger gathering than probably any given, you know, um, Kol Nidre or, you know, sa you know Freedom Seder or whatever. Thousands of people there um, from lots of different congregations. Um, what they decided to do was a very peaceful protest. What they decided to do to express their grief or, or uh, their sense that there was a tear in the fabric of the universe was, was to perform a kind of Korea. You know that when um, somebody dies, one tradition is to affix a black ribbon to your clothing and tear that, if, if not to tear your own clothing. Um, so they handed out pieces of black paper, and when somebody gave the symbol, they all reached up. This, they were like near where the Trump motorcade was, and they all ripped at once. They went silent and just tore these pieces of black paper. Not everyone was so subtle. <laughs> um, this was not the rule by any means, but it's, you know, there, was, there was that as well. Um, there was one arrest at the anti-Trump protest. There was one arrest. University of Pittsburgh sociologist uh, Joshua Bloom sat down in front of the motorcade and began praying and chanting and uh, meditating and, and had to be taken away forcibly by Pittsburgh police, who he said to me were very gentle with him, and he was released the next day, and no charges were pressed, but he, he was cleared out that night. Um, celebrities come in the aftermath of a mass killing. Here's Tom Hanks with his arm around Joanne Rogers, uh, Mr. Rogers' widow, at an event that winter. Now, this, this is an important photograph, historically speaking. Does anyone know uh, whom that luscious head of white hair belongs to? Yeah? Robert Kraft, right, the owner of the New England Patriots. Um, now, <clears throat> again, we're talking about celebrities. Every celebrity, for whatever reason, was in Pittsburgh. They all would go to Not Tree of Life, which was not yet, which is still not being used again, but they would go to Rodef Sholem, which was renting space to Tree of Life. They would go to the Tree of Life service and pay respects. So in um, December, Robert Kraft showed up. The, the Patriots were in town to play the Steelers the next day. And Kraft, who, by the way, is a pretty learned Jew, uh, grew up in a very observant home, uh, showed up to give the bar mitzvah boy, there was a bar mitzvah that day, to give the bar mitzvah boy a couple tickets to the owner's box or the visiting owner's box at the stadium the next day. He ha they gave him an aliyah. Um, I, I always wondered who didn't get an Aaliyah because Robert Kraft showed up. <laughs> like, had Aunt Sylvia been practicing? <laughs> like she had it. And like she gets bigfooted by Robert Kraft from the page. Like, sorry, Aunt Sylvia, Bob Kraft is here. It's entirely possible it didn't go down like that. You know, my show always reserved, reserved at least one aliyah or two for members, even on a sit day when there's a simcha. They may have known he was coming. I don't know, but I just like that idea that Aunt Sylvia got bumped for Robert Kraft. <laughs> but, but, but to his great credit, Robert Kraft did show up wearing Tim Hines's yarmulke the, with, the, with the Stronger Than Hate logo. Now, I, as I said, I don't take photographs um, in shul, but um, I did feel that on su for such a time as this, as they say in the Megillah, um, a New England Patriots owner wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers garb is a once in a millennium event. <laughs> it's not going to happen again until Moshiach comes. And so I felt that I should take my phone out and surreptitiously snap a photograph of it. So, so I did. By the way, ever the good journalist, I then wanted to get a craft interview. So I followed him into the men's room when I saw him getting up. <laughs> and I stood next to him as one in, men, in men's room fashion. And um, and uh, 
he told me, that he, we chatted, he told me that his bar mitzvah parsha had been Bahalosacha, and, um, and he, he asked me, he said, he had given a few, spoken a few words, he said, did I do okay? I said, you did fine. And then he zipped up and washed his hands and left. And I didn't get, I didn't get any good scoop on anything. This is, by the way, a few weeks before he had his little encounter with the law that you should know about. Um, okay, one of, uh, I'm getting to the end. The penultimate photo here is that one of the other things that comes in the aftermath of a mass killing, right? Because we're talking about what happens to a community, what comes? Um, you know, we've talked about how visual art comes, we've talked about how money comes, we've talked about how celebrities come. Doggies come, and I'm a big dog person, and um, I was just, I thought it was great that there were therapy animals and support animals and canine advocates, as some of them are called, everywhere. Um, and there were local nonprofits. This, some dogs came from afar. There were dogs that came from hundreds of miles away. Their owners brought them to just be out there and supporting people. And then there was a local nonprofit that made sure its dogs were at Tish above and at, you know, all sorts of sad services where people might want to hug a dog. I don't know which dogs these are, but if you look closely, you can see this girl is petting the dogs. She's on her way, I think, to the police station with a note. If you read it, it says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe. Um, Lily, age six. And below that, it says, thank you for risking your lives to save my Jewish community. Love, Mickey, age nine. So they're delivering thank you cards to the police, and she stops to pet the dog. And the last photo I want to show is... Um, this guy named Robert Zacharias, he's not a member of Tree of Life. I don't think he belongs to any local shul. He grew up in New Jersey at a big reform temple, ended up at Pittsburgh. He teaches something very complicated at Carnegie Mellon, robotics or artificial intelligence, something I'm not trained to understand. And um, we became sort of friendly. And I forget why I first interviewed him, but he was wearing a yarmulke. And I said, oh, are you, like, do you go to Sherry Torah? Do you go to like Polite Set? I was like asking about Orthodox shuls. He said, no, no, I don't. I don't go to any of those. And it turned out his story was that um, the, um, the day of the shooting, he decided to go to the Habdala service that it was being organized by the teenagers. And before he went, he, he thought, I should, wear, I should wear a kippah. So he reached into, like, you know, like a lot of adult male Jews, he has the emergency kippah, which is like in the back of a drawer somewhere. And it's from, you know, if you read it, it's from like a cousin's bar mitzvah <laughs> nine years ago. And it's probably one of those horrible suede ones. Um, and he like slapped it, he found his emergency heap and he slapped it on and he went and he wore it to the vigil and then he wore it, he was going to a party afterwards and he wore it to the party and then the next morning he got up and he, he put it on again and the day after that he put it on again and at that point he probably thought I'll wear it for a week, I'll wear it till the end of Shiva or Shloshim or you know whatever and he just kept wearing it and here he was you know I mean this, I met him a couple months later but he sent me this picture a couple years later when the book was done, and I saw him in Pittsburgh in October, and he still walks around in a yarmulke. I don't know if he ever decided to keep kosher. I don't know if he goes to shul. I don't know if he fasts in Yom Kippur. But he just, this is his thing. It's like, I'm going to represent visually that I am of those people. And to me, that symbolizes so much. Like, this is a guy you will never read about. This is not a guy who's active even in the Jewish community of Pittsburgh. And maybe he's a little more so now. I don't know. But there are all these, what I wanted to do as a reporter was get all of these, these voices that aren't captured by the national press that comes in for three days, the CNN, the MSNBC, the Fox News, they come in with their cameras, they do three days and then they leave and then maybe they come back for the one year anniversary. But they don't, they don't meet the people whose lives are changed and who change each other in these smaller and subtle but very beautiful ways. So it's people like, like Robert Zacharias, it's people like Lynn Hyde, who, just, who had always thought maybe she'd convert to Judaism. She'd always loved Jewish culture. She was married to a Jewish guy. Um, but then when she heard the sirens going past her house that morning and she later found out where they were going, she just decided, I'm all in. Like it's, This is the world saying to me that I should really finally get off my tuchus and convert. And she did. She actually went to her mikvah during COVID. It was a very complicated thing, a COVID conversion, but she did it. Um, you know, I think about people like... Um, you know, Rose McKee from Minneapolis, who, African-American Christian woman who makes sweet potato pies for people who have lost people. She's sort of the crosses for losses, but with baked pies. And she wanted to bring pies to Pittsburgh. This is her thing. She's a one-woman nonprofit. She flies and brings pies because she feels like they're symbolic of black culture. She wants to give them to people from other cultures. But before she did, she had this voice in the back of her head that said, I think I have to bake them a special way if the Jews want to eat them. So she... She went to the day school, the Jewish day school outside Minneapolis-St. Paul, 
I think in St. Louis Park, and said, can I use your kitchen? Will you show me how to do this for the Jews? So they told her about kosher ingredients, they let her use their kitchen, and she baked kosher bean pies for them and then flew them to Pittsburgh and gave them to members of the synagogues. Um, you know, I think about all of these different stories, all of these different people, the converts, the people who change how they dress, the people who change how they look, the people who brought challahs all over Squirrel Hill and left them on doorsteps anonymously and then just like disappeared into the night. And I think that those little acts are more likely to occur in all sorts of ways I explain in the book in a community like Squirrel Hill that is so multi-generational, that is so interfaith and intrafaith, where people know each other, where it's densely compact and walkable, um, where people feel safe on the streets, where people bump into each other and offer each other hugs at the Giant Eagle supermarket or the post office. I mean, you're talking about a community where in 15 minutes, as you know, you can walk from the post office to the supermarket to the kosher market to about five different synagogues to the public high school, um, to the bookstore, to the wine shop, all of it in about 15 minutes. And every place along the way, you're going to get a hug after something like this happens. And the contrast between that and the kind of isolation that so many people in America experience after a mass killing, if they live in sort of sprawling, exurban, far-flung suburbs where they don't know anyone, where they lead their lives online, the contrast there helps tell us why a place like Squirrel Hill in the aftermath of something ter terrible finds a way not just to survive but also to thrive. Thank you. So what can I tell you? Do you have any questions? Yes? When will you be back to talk about unorthodox? My podcast? Yeah. Oh, the podcast is every Thursday. But are you? you? Yeah, no, I've been on it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've had some weeks off. You might have listened to some weeks that I took off. We all take vacation sometimes. <laughs> but I was on this week. I, in the past month, I might have had two weeks off, actually. But I'm on this week. I was on the Thursday. I'm on next Thursday. Thank you for checking. <laughs> all is well. I'm actually going in Tuesday. We're going to record it together in, in, our, in our offices for the first time. You know something sad? Our studio, Argo Studios, which is this wonderful midtown recording studio where we used to record closed during COVID. Paul Ruest, he was in his 60s. I think he was able to retire. And he was just like, I can't. I mean, that first six months just killed him. He just like was paying extremely high rent. And uh, so now we've, we've kind of built our own studio, which is great, but it'll be different. Yes? Yeah. It almost seems like how America used to be. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if this says something about what's, what ails America. Yes. And why there is so much hate yeah. and vitriol. One of the reasons. Oh, you're good. OK, yes. <laughs> yes. That is the secret thesis of my book. Yes. Um, yes, it does. So this is how America used to be, um, not uniquely. I mean, we used to be a much more agricultural and rural country as well. So people lived on farms. America was not like this. And that used to be more people. But if you weren't a farming family and you were an urban family, it used to be that we didn't have as many cars and we, you, we lived in, you know, within the reach of trolleys and streetcars and subways. And, um, and that was destroyed by government policy, by the Eisenhower interstate system, where they basically built a country instead of for rails and public transit, they built a country for cars and the car industry. And this is been well discussed by people more qualified than I. And it was to facilitate the big move to the suburbs. It was to facilitate the ability of people to live farther and farther out, which to some extent was inevitable because the country was growing um, and is growing. But it didn't have to be done the way it was. And it could have been done more mindfully and without the huge giveaways to the auto industry that essentially, in many communities, ensure that you can't, you can't walk anymore. <laughs> I mean. You know, in my town you still can, here you still can, but all of us know about communities where they don't have sidewalks, where it's literally just cul-de-sacs, where like if you try to ride your bike, you'll get run over by SUVs. And that was policy. It was something we did to ourselves. And so it's been enormously destructive. Um, but there are places where it's not like that, and there are places that are rebuilding a sense of how it can be like that. Certainly all the evidence, um, all of the evidence, and I'm pretty well versed in it, shows 
that you know, two quick routes to happiness and to fending off despair are to live near people you care about and to not have a long commute, right? Being near people you care about and seeing them physically often is one of the best predictors of happiness and also of longevity because if, you're, if you fall or if there are people who can check in on you, make sure you're taking your meds, see, say you don't look well. I mean, there are obvious reasons why bumping into people promotes longevity, aside from just the kind of you're happier and that seems to de decrease stress. Um, number one, live near people you love. Number two, um, don't spend all your time in cars. So, you know, you can draw the inferences from there. Um, but you said something deeper. You said, is this why we're in the state we're in with like the opioid addiction and the despair and the, right? Yes, so one of the most powerful books I read recently was Sam Quinones' book, Dreamland, which came out about four or five years ago, won a lot of big awards. It's about the opioid crisis. And he gets to the end and he kind of shifts gears having described all these interesting stories about the trade routes of opium from Mexico up here and how it's sold and cartels and gangs and addictive properties and Purdue Pharma, all the stuff you kind of know. He then gets to the end and says, you know, remember that drugs, different drugs do different things to us, right? There's a reason why if you want to party at a wedding, you serve alcohol, right? Alcohol decreases inhibitions. It is a depressive, but it doesn't put you right to sleep the way opioids do. Like, it's, it's a good party drug, basically. Cocaine's a different drug and does different things to you. Opioids are a drug that alleviates loneliness. It makes you feel loved, right? What it, what it mimics in your brain, endorphin-wise, is the feeling you get when you're falling in love and when, you're around, when you feel loved, when you've just had a baby and everyone's there for the shower. That feeling, when you don't have that feeling, opio getting hooked on opioids is one replacement. Um, in a way that marijuana and amphetamines and alcohol, they do different things. But there is very strong reason to believe that if you have an epidemic of loneliness or purposelessness, opioid rush, opioids give you well, a sense of well-being that you should be getting from other things. So it is, I mean, he makes a very powerful case, and I think it's very true, that if you want to understand a lot of what we're going through as a country, you know, the epidemic of loneliness, and then of course put people online away from actual human interaction, like, what, what are we doing to ourselves? So I do think, I'm glad when people take from the book the kind of subtext that this is another way of being. Yes? Um, I'm assuming you've read Zero Horn's book. Um, people hate, people love dead Jews. Love dead Jews. I always like get the title, it's like people hate live Jews, but people love dead Jews, right? Yeah, I do, I did, yeah, it's a great book. Everything. Everything. Yeah. yeah. And this, in particular, it's hard not to sort of like hark you back to that thought when you see how, you know, this community commemorated mm -hmm. this horrific event and how it's so beautiful that everybody came right. together and all this outpouring of wonderful sentiment, but it's still hard sure. not yeah. to get past that idea yeah. of, yeah, well, okay, but we're, what about other times? Right. So the question is, like, what do I make of Darahorn's thesis that um, in the book, People Love Dead Jews? that basically people love dead Jews but don't really love living Jews, that there's always tremendous, do you feel like it's a fair praises of it, that um, there's always, you know, people love commemorating Jews, people love Holocaust museums, people love the Diary of Anne Frank, they always want to draw, in particular Gentiles love them, they always want to show how, how much they love, they want to commemorate our deaths, but they aren't always as supportive of us when we're alive. Um, I think her book is largely correct. I love the book, I think it's a really good book. I don't love every chapter of the book, I mean, she argues different things. Um, I think Dara's really smart and, and a good novelist, and I think it's a really good book. Um, I, should, I should say that I don't think her book and mine are in tension. She's largely talking about how Gentiles feel toward Jews. My book, and it's been criticized for this, is largely about the Jewish response to what happened to Jews. And people will always say to me, and it's always some like well-meaning it's, you know, I was gonna say, it's always some well-meaning liberal. Well, I'm a well-meaning liberal, so I'm not picking on well-meaning liberals. <laughs> but it's always some well-meaning liberals like, why didn't you say more about the beautiful interfaith response and what the Unitarians did and what the Muslims did and what the Catholics did? It's like, because A, you know, that's not the story I was telling. And B, they didn't do that much. <laughs> like, any interfaith response is meaningful, but, you know, it is nice that, that these communities raise some money. And, and there are people in these communities, there are, 
you know, there was the, the Episcopal Church that offered Tree of Life space so they could hold high holiday services. And there are people like Wasi Muhammad in the Muslim community who was really instrumental in a kind of interfaith response. There are great humans everywhere in every community. But within a couple weeks, most other communities moved on. But the other thing I always want to say about that, and by the way, like that, that's typical of all killings, right? Which is whatever the response is from outside the community disappears very quickly. But the other thing I want to say about that is like, that's okay. People have finite mental bandwidth. I don't hold in my heart like 20 mass killings. I'm not still thinking about Aurora, Illinois or Las Vegas. How could I? I'm not thinking about Newtown and I live near Newtown because I have to earn a living and I have to hang out with my kids and I have to like ensure that my wife and I get some time alone and I have to stay, play tennis for my well-being. Like, because I have to live and I can't stay in a, live in a state of constant grief. And um, that's okay, that's adaptive. People move on. And even Jews move on. I mean, the, 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 comm the commemoration ceremony on the first yard site was like so big and it was half again as big the following year and half again as big and pretty soon it'll be like 10 people because we got stuff to do. Like there's, there's Netflix to watch. That's life, that's good. So, you know, I always put to people the test You'll tell me if I'm not answering your question, if, if I'm, this is like not getting at the heart of what you want. But I always give you all the test. There have been three or 400 mass killings since 1999, pretty much in as many different cities. How many of the cities can you name? I can't name 10. Like I peter out around seven. Charleston, Orlando, Parkland, Las Vegas, Eureka, Milwaukee, Pittsburgh. And then I'm spent. Like could I eke my way up to 12? Probably. But that's okay, because what would your life be like if you held 200 mass killings in your head? So, um, you know, and I believe that as a Jew, like Judaism is for the living, we're a religion of life, we're not a religion of death. And, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I share Dara's dubiousness about Holocaust commemoriza com com commemorization, is that the word? Commemorating, I don't know. Uh, like, that can't be our Judaism. And that's, that's her subtext, is like, hey Jews, us too. Like, with the Holocaust, we have to remember it, but like Gnuk, we also have to show up for each other now. We have to like, Simchas Torah is more important than Yom HaShoah. So I think, I don't know, I think it's a great book. And I, I, think, it's, I think we're saying similar things in different ways. Yes, sir. A Pittsburgh boy. That's great to know. Yes. By the way, in New Haven, there's also a Roberto Clemente school. He has a lot of schools. So yeah, yeah. It's 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 very sad. It's a very sad. It's a great point. It's ironic that it occurred in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I'm just going to repeat everything for the people on Zoom. Yes, sir. Also, I'm going to give quicker answers to get to more of you. Yeah. Right, of course. You are famous. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, 
there is something about how, you know the federal the reason this is a federal crime and the DOJ is prosecuted is because murder at a house of worship is a you know gets an enhancement gets kicked up to the federal level. I mean, there is something about it that's really, really terrible. And you also bring up the question of what to do security-wise, which I think is a very complicated thing that we tend to flatten out. And I'm happy to talk more about that if people are curious. I want to make sure I don't overstay my welcome. Maybe three more questions, and then you'll tell me if you want more of me. I'm going to sign books and chat with you, but I don't want to detain people who have lives to leave. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have a question. Okay. I loved your book. Thank you. Yeah. And and I and I told her what it was and she goes, Oh, and then she goes, I'm from that neighborhood. Yeah. And she said, What does the what does the what do those letters mean? And I told her, Well, to make a long story short, for two hours on the way home, all we did was talk. she asked me a million questions about Judaism. <laughs> It is definitely one of the, thank you for sharing that. It's, def, it's definitely one of the magical things about being an author is the different places where, you know, where, where your book ends up is kind of, is kind of magical and it's, uh, it's its own kind of reward. Um, yes? So one of my roles professionally is I coordinate the mental health response. Yeah. Community. Should something like this happen? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is there anything the community had done beforehand to prepare themselves? Um, yes. I mean, it had a number of advantages. One is that in Pittsburgh, which again is geographically compact and has many, many multi-generational families in many ethnic communities, and it's still a city with strong ethnic ties to it. You know, it's a city of neighborhoods and a city of ethnicities, and that serves it well. Uh, in fact, the, the, I think she's a city council person from Squirrel Hill. I can't remember if she's a state rep or a city council person. Erica Strasberger. Strasberger is one of the four founding families of the Jewish neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Uh, my great, great, great grandfather, William Frank, and three other people, including Mr. Strasberger, in 1847 bought the land uh, for the first Jewish graveyard in Pittsburgh. And that was kind of like how you know Jews are staying. When you get a mikvah in a graveyard, you're staying. And and so there are still Franks in Pittsburgh, my fourth cousins, and there are still Strasburgers, and one of them is married to the woman. She's actually not a Strasburger. She married him, who's still the city councilor. So like, the, it goes so deep. So that's an advantage. The Jews and the Gentiles know each other, which is an advantage. Somebody said to me, when something like this happens, we at the Federation already had the mayor, the chief of staff, the head of security, the head of the hospital, the head of you know, mental health services, all the social work agencies on speed dial. We'd already been meeting with them, I don't know, monthly, biannually, whatever. But the key thing is the relationships have to come. You have, they have to proceed. If you're starting to build relationships when this happens, that's too late. So that's number one. Number two, JFCS, Jewish Family and Children's Services, is like a very robust, important social work agency, well-funded in the heart of Squirrel Hill. I'm sure you have a similar Jewish social work agency here that's like, maybe you are the Jewish social work agency. So, you know, like, yeah, but, you know, JFCS is like a big deal, and they were ready to spring into action. Um, the, the third thing I'd say is, of course, a lot of people's mental health services are their synagogue. A lot of people turn to their rabbi, their pastor, their somebody they know there, the person who performed their wedding, their cantor, a lay leader. And that's the, that's the therapeutics they need in terms of having just someone to sit with them. And so, and this was a group of people who, by definition, were shulgoers. So one of the interesting things that happened was, and this is in the book, is that there is a, there's a big federal grant that comes in, that kicks in if, if an act of mass terror happens. The DOJ, the Office of Victims, Office of Victim Services, I think, has millions of dollars they'll give you. The question is, can you spend it well? And do you need it? Because what they, sh what they probably should have done in Pittsburgh was instead of setting up a new center, the 1027 Healing Partnership, and I want to tread lightly here because you know, they were also hampered by COVID 
and they may have done a lot of work that I don't know about, partly because they won't tell me and they won't show me their financials, but they set up a new trauma center and healing center with these several million dollars in federal money. I guess what I would say is there's probably an argument that they should have taken that money and dispersed it to groups that already were on the ground. So one thing you'd want to think about is if you got a big pot of money, because if, if 11 people are shot, you will get a big pot of money, both in private donations and government funds. How can you use it so that it doesn't replicate what's already there? How can you enrich the resources you already have rather than necessarily starting anew? That's a great question, though. Is there a final question? Sir. Yeah. I'll repeat all this, by the way. Yeah. Um, so the question was, you know, looking at how this community meant so much to the two intellectually disabled brothers who died, uh, who had fragile X syndrome, um, and, and had been in the bosom of this community, not just the synagogue community, but, you know, one of them had friends at the firehouse, and, you know, they, they, were, they were kind of Squirrel, Squirrel Hill locals, and everyone knew them, um, in some cases gave them odd jobs to do, gave them a sense of purpose and community, took care of them. And they were, and they also, you know, they helped make the minion. I mean, they were two guys who showed up, two of ten, a lot of the time, and they were both murdered that day. Um, how do you convey the meaning of that? You mean besides buying people my book? Um, <laughs> the uh, there's this book about the meaning of that. No, but um, the I think you're asking in some sense a continuity question, like how do we replicate for people who aren't necessarily drawn to Jewish community the importance of it, and I think that's a terrific question to which there are lots of good answers. Let me just give you one, right? I, I, try, I get asked this, and I always want to say I'm not a rabbi. I know you're not asking me, you're asking me as a journalist, but I always feel a little bit of imposter syndrome because I don't do that work. And some of my favorite people do that work, right? Some of my favorite people are clergy and community builders and you know Jewish communal professionals, which I'm not. So I can only give you a journalistic response, which is to say that in my travels across the country, and you know, having met Jews in 48 states, I'm still waiting for someone to fly me to Hawaii. Um, the, there's some shul in Hawaii that wants to bring me. The, um, you know, what I can say is it starts with very, very small acts of Hamishness, right? That, um, well, let me, let me give you two answers. One is Shabbat dinner, right? Like I was saying to a group in Denver, that was taught, we were sort of talking in a sort of small group uh, with some of the people who were trying to do young adult programming, and I said, if every older person in this room invited a, new, a young family to Shabbat dinner, if, if, every, if every family when they moved to Greater Denver got five Shabbat dinners, that would be like transforming the world, right? And I think that it's one of the practices we've lost is just the, the practice of home-based hospitality. It's hard to do. It's also hard to get outside our comfort zone. I know for me it is, and invite people whom we don't know precisely because they're new to the community, so we tend to invite our old friends. And I just think that like, a lot of Jews, when they move somewhere, or when they're starting their own family, it's, it's, it's incredibly meaningful when Jews with a little more stability reach out and offer them hospitality, whether it's a Hanukkah party, a Shabbat dinner. It, it's, it's low barrier to entry. You don't have to speak Hebrew. It's not intimidating. You're just, people are saying, can we feed you? Can we party with you? So I guess I put that out there as one thing that I feel like none of us can ever do enough of. Um, the other thing I can say is, and I mean, just thinking about what I try to model with my own children is, when we're raising children, one thing we, can, we should feel bold about asking of other Jews is that they show up for us when we need them. So if we need a tenth person to say Kaddish, if, we, if someone is mourning and we need people for the Shiva call, if it's Purim and we need to like, you know, we, and, and every Jew should get Shlach Manot, should get a Purim basket, I have decided it's okay to call on people who don't want to be called on, including my own children, and say this is something you have to do. If you are commanded to do this, this is not optional. And if a community treats certain things as non-optional, which in my community I think largely includes bringing meals to, new, to people with new babies, showing up for shiva calls, 
and giving you know, tzedakah on Purim, if you have a few things where you say to your children, as long as you're under my roof, I don't care if you're bar mitzvah and you make your own decisions, yada, yada. As long as you're under my roof, you will go visit this person in the hospital. You will help this person mourn. You will help me make the challah for this family that has a new baby and is feeling overwhelmed. If we keep doing those things, and if we say to the new family in town, we actually need you from, I heard you move down the street. Will you help us make a minion? They might say no. But I do think some aspect of what you're talking about requires the boldness to say to, pe to, to ask of people, rather than just trying to serve them. Right? A lot of what we try to do is like, come to our happy hour. Like, oh, you're a new Jew in town? We'll serve you booze. And that's one piece of it. That's the hospitality piece. The other piece is like, you're a new Jew in town? We're going to ask you to do stuff. And you know, some people will be driven away, but some people will feel like, yeah, I probably should. And I just, um, I don't know. A lot of this comes from me as a parent of adolescents thinking about what it's okay for me to ask of them, even as they individuate and try to become their own people and get more autonomy. Anyway, you are amazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here. While you were speaking, I texted Natalie Trubman, <laughs> who, who was my student, Aww. and um, she and Benj will be at us Rui, at our reform movement camp yes. with us this summer That's great. Um, and she was very grateful and appreciative and um, there's a lot more to that story about the, the headline on the newspaper if you want to hear it I, I have some insight and so does Mark I'm sure. Um, Mark is now going to move to the back of the room and sign books. Um, we have many, they make wonderful Father's Day gifts, they make wonderful gifts to your kids. Buy, buy them, we have them at a significantly discounted price. So um, thank you all for being here, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall when we restart our adult ed program in earnest.